Hey, hey, hey! My name's Helianthus Cryptid, or Nephilim if you prefer. Welcome to my cosy corner of the internet. After a small break, I am back with some more angst. I had my tongue pierced so I couldn't really speak, but I am so excited to be back once again. This is Unforeseen Consequences, written by Yamadad Zawa on AO3. To prepare you for the angst, here is the summary of this one shot. It turns out, threatening to withhold medical treatment from a 15-year-old has consequences. Some are predictable, but others... less so. Now I implore you to sit back and relax whilst I read to you. Unforeseen Consequences The words still echo through Azuku's mind, and past the full-body ache he felt coming out of surgery, there's something else now too. He's sweating, but it's nothing like what he feels after training. He's cold and jittery, and the back of his neck prickles sharply, especially whenever Recovery Girl walks back into view. All Might had to leave a few minutes ago to change and get ready for the medal ceremony. A few other students ebb in and out of the medical centre, and for some reason, Azuku finds himself watching Recovery Girl's interactions with them, analysing every word, flinching at every admonishing tone. And Azuku knows this feeling. It'd be impossible not to after carrying it for nearly a decade before coming to UA. But it's been months since it last happened, so what... Just know, I won't be healing injuries like this anymore. I am not going to keep doing this, Midoriya. You need to find a better way for him to use his power, something less destructive. You're always so clumsy, and you need to stop provoking those boys. It's your fault you keep getting hurt. Oh. Oh. Izuku forgot. He spent the first week or two on edge trying to read his teachers the way he has every year since second grade, but that quickly fell to the side in favour of updating his analysis entries on all of them. Azuku forgot. He'd been so caught up in his hero worship that he forgot. The staff at UA are all heroes, but they're also teachers. And teachers don't like him. Up until now, he's been seeing Recovery Girl's actions towards him as scolding, exasperated maybe, yet still tinged with fondness towards a hero hopeful. But was he wrong? Was he always one mistake away from, I won't be healing injuries like this anymore. I won't waste any more time on you. Azuku's vision greys at the edges as he looks down at his scarred hands and wonders, is it just Recovery Girl? Or has Azuku missed the warning signs with all of his teachers? He remembers now he has to be careful. There's an awkward gap between choosing their hero names and waiting for internship week. Azuku's skin crawls under his uniform, and the bandages on his arms and hands itch unbearably, leave him flushed and overheated. His notes have been suffering so far today, as he loses focus on lectures to carefully note his teacher's expressions when they look at him, and their tone when they say his name, and the pain. Azuku forgot this too. The sore muscles and joints, a result of sitting tensed in his seat for hours. He used to be better at this back in middle school. He knew how to keep a watch on his teacher and his peers and still keep his notes up to standard. He could anticipate shifts in tone, predict when attention would be fired his way and prepare accordingly. It's been just over a month and he's out of practice, 
So when Yamada Sensei calls on him to read the next phrase on the board, he jumps. Stupid. Hazashi knows some of the kids are all probably still worn out from the sports festival, even with the days off they had after, especially the ones who made it to the third round, and especially Midoriya. He's doing his best to keep things light today, and he purposefully picked a few English tongue twisters for the kiddos to try out. Laughter is the best medicine, after all. Midoriya is nervous. Hisashi can tell from the way he jumped when he called on the little listener. But his attempt is good. His tongue twister isn't easy, but he very nearly gets it. He just stumbles over a few words and Hisashi laughs good-naturedly, flashing the kid a big smile. You almost had it, little listener, he praises. Keep practicing and you'll get that one in no time. Izuku is burning as he sinks into his seat. Yamada-sensei's laughter still rings sharply through his ears, echoed by the laughter of his classmates. You almost had it, Yamada-sensei says. Izuku doesn't believe him. I suppose that's close enough. Keep practicing and you'll get it in no time. Past Yamada Sensei's smile, Azuku can't help but wonder if he's being mocked. Keep practicing, Midoriya. Maybe you'll have a chance to catch up with the rest of the class. Out of all of his co workers, Ectoplasm prides himself on being the best at keeping a close eye on all 20 students at once. And no, not with the use of his quirk though he did get good at it because of his quirk. Awareness of his surroundings and everyone in them comes naturally, but it's also a skill he's honed for years. Aizawa is the only one who may edge him out of that best spot someday. So Ectoplasm can tell, just minutes after class begins, that Midoriya Izuku is having a bad day. He hasn't seen the boy this on edge or jittery since the first week of class. He makes a mental note to say something to Aizawa. For now, he keeps class moving, and calls on Midoriya when it's his turn. His stutter from the first week is back as well, and he won't look right at ectoplasm. The man tries not to let that sting. Midoriya was the first child to ever look at him without a trace of fear the day they first met, and Ectoplasm thinks he understands now why some heroes like attention. Midoriya's answer is close, but he skipped a step towards the end of the problem, leaving him with the incorrect answer. Ectoplasm tells him this as gently as he can, instead of the usual determined spark in his eyes, though, there's stress. Ectoplasm decides to let the kid have a break for the rest of the hour, and doesn't call on him again. Damn it, damn it, damn it! How could he have missed that step? Ectoplasm Sensei is ignoring him now, not even looking at him to answer another question, and Azuku feels like his chest is full of wasps. He can do better, he knows he can do better, but Sensei won't look at him, won't call on him, won't let him try again. I gave you your chance, Midoriya. I have other students to teach, you know. Izuku curls a hand over the back of his head and ducks his face down, keeping his eyes on his notes. If Sensei is in the mood to ignore him, he needs to stay small. Shame curls in his gut and Izuku tries to ignore the feeling of his classmates' eyes burning into him. Something is wrong with Midoriya. Shota wouldn't have needed Ectoplasm's note to figure that out. He just knows. The kid is curled in on himself. His hands are shaking and his lip is bitten raw. Shota's seen him anxious before, but never this bad. He has two options here, and he wrestles between them, weighing the consequences of each. 
He can let Midoriya participate in the exercise and see if the activity coaxes that spark of determination out of him. Or he can have the kid sit out, give him a break and some time to himself. While Shota is deciding what to do when the kids are waiting for instructions, Kaminari and Kirishima say something that gets to Bakugo, and the boy pops off a few small explosions in their direction to make his anger known. Midoriya flinches, and that makes Shota's decision for him. If the kid is this on edge right now, it's not safe for him to participate. He could get hurt. Rather than single the kid out and remove him in front of everyone, Shota explains the exercise and sends the brats to the locker rooms to change. Before Midoriya can leave, Shota subtly gets his attention and motions him over. Midoriya's shoulders hunch as he walks over, and his hands twist and bunch together in front of him, which can't be good for him after what happened at the sports festival. Shota reaches out and taps lightly on Midoriya's hand, frowning when the kid freezes and tenses. Don't do that. Shota scolds as gently as he can. Midoriya nods and puts his hands at his sides, and Shota notices that he stills almost entirely, save for some small twitches here and there. Shota sighs and lays a hand on the kid's shoulder. You seem pretty wound up today, Shota says. Is everything all right? Midoriya's mouth thins into a tight line and he nods firmly. I'm fine, sensei, he replies, a faint tremble in his voice. Shota frowns. Are you sure? Shota presses. If there's anything wrong, you can tell me. If I can't help you myself, I'll find someone who can, okay? Yes, sensei, Midoriya whispers. But I'm fine. Hmm. Shota will have to stop pressing, for now at least. All right, he relents. But I think you should sit out today. This exercise requires a lot of focus, and I'm worried you'll get hurt. Shota likes to think he knows Midoriya pretty well by now, so he's expecting a burst of energy, fists clenched at his sides, loud, passionate protesting. That's not what happens. Midoriya wilts. His face just barely starts to crumple before he seems to catch himself and smooths it out. Yes, sensei. He repeats, even quieter than before. Shota wonders for a moment if the kid even spoke. Something is wrong, and Shota has to admit it's scaring him a little. He squeezes the kid's shoulder lightly. Why don't you go and see Recovery Girl, he suggests. Maybe some rest will do you good. Midoriya nods, so Shota writes him a note and sends him on his way. He has a hard time getting that small, quiet voice out of his head for the rest of the day. He knows. I think you should sit out today. Midoriya, go sit on the bench. You're not joining today. I'm worried you'll get hurt. You're just gonna get hurt if you try to play like everybody else. You're too fragile. Aizawa-sensei knows. Aizawa-sensei is like them. No, no, that can't be right. Aizawa-sensei saved them, protected them at the USJ. He still wears the proof of his care of them on his body. Maybe he hates Azuku like the rest of them, but he's still not like them. He can't be. Azuku doesn't want to see Recovery Girl. He's not injured from his quirk, but he still feels guilty, and he's scared that she'll grow even more tired of him if he's back in her office so soon. He's done nothing but make mistakes today. He can't keep doing this. He has to be better. He has to do better. He stops as he passes one of the training facilities. 
Eater, he thinks. It's a large building filled with smaller training rooms, fit for individuals or small groups. Izuku peers through the window and doesn't see anyone working a check-in area or anything. He tries the door, and the air in his chest rushes out in a gasp when it opens. He steps inside and starts looking around, until he ends up walking down the hall that has individualised rooms. He sees one that's empty and approaches it. His heart hammers at his throat and he tries the door. Locked. Damn it! It's then that he notices a spot for his ID to scan and realises that students probably have to reserve a room to get keyed in. No matter how much he wants to try his ID on the door, he knows it's not a good idea. Trying to sneak in some extra training? A voice startles him from behind and Azuku yelps. He whirls around to see an older boy, a second or third year, grinning at him. Trying to sneak in some extra training? A voice startles him from behind and Azuku yelps. He whirls around to see an older boy, a second or third year, grinning at him. Well, uh, no! Azuku waves his hands frantically. I was just looking, honest. The boy laughs and shakes his head. Don't look so nervous, I'm not going to get you in trouble. He nudges Azuku to the side and swipes his ID card on the door. You were pretty badass in the festival. I don't mind giving you my hour. The door beeps and the boy opens it for Azuku. Just try not to break anything, okay? I'd rather not get in trouble with Snipe Sensei. Azuku tries to argue, but the boy just places a hand between his shoulders and pushes him into the room. Azuku realises that any resistance his feet should have made as he dug them into the ground seems to have done nothing, negated by the boy's touch. By the time he turns around to gush about the boy's quirk, he's gone. The door swings shut behind him. Azuku turns back around and looks at the room. It's small compared to the rest of the facility, but it's still probably bigger than all of the rooms in his apartment combined. There's equipment stored neatly along one of the walls, along with some training dummies. Azuku sets his bag down and shrugs out of his uniform jacket and dress shirt down to his undershirt. He moves one of the dummies to the centre of the room and secures it in place. He starts with some warm-ups and stretching, and then cycles through some basic exercises, not using his quirk yet. It feels good to burn off some of this energy, to work his nerves and anger out on the dummy, but that only lasts for so long before Izuku's mind starts to catch up with him. As he starts thinking about how to use his quirk without hurting himself, he wonders what Aizawa sensei told the rest of the class when they returned from their lockers and he wasn't there. Did anyone even notice? A pitiful part of his mind whispers. Of course they did! Ida and Uraraka would notice, at the very least. But what did Aizawa sensei tell them? That he was too weak to join them, too fragile, that they had to be careful with him since he's quirkless. That's not now. That's not Aizawa sensei. He doesn't know, and even if he did... If he did, what would he say? How would he treat Izuku? How would any of them treat him, if they knew? Would they still want to be his friend? Would they still smile at him, accept him for all his weird habits? Kachan could tell them, but he hasn't. But what if he did? Why hasn't he? None of them know yet, but Yamada-sensei still made fun of him, Ectoplasm-sensei still ignored him, Aizawa-sensei still figured out that he's weak, Recovery Girl still, still grew tired of helping him. Won't help him anymore, because if he gets hurt, it's his own fault. And he does get hurt, that is. He's so tangled in his thoughts, so tightly wound, that... When he tries to break free, he accidentally uses one for all for a split second when he throws his next punch at the dummy. Thankfully, nothing in the room breaks. Izuku's left wrist isn't so lucky. 
He's broken enough bones by now to know that it's almost certainly broken. He keens quietly, and cradles his wrist close to his chest, tears stinging his eyes. The Eater facility isn't too far from Recovery Girl's office, it's just a short walk and then... Then nothing. He can't go to her. She'll be able to tell. She'll know he hurt himself with his quirk again. And she told him she won't heal injuries like this anymore. He has to deal with this on his own. There's a first aid kit in the room, and he gets lucky. There's a wrist brace along with a cold pack. He unwraps the bandages that were already on his wrist, left over from the sports festival, and awkwardly gets the brace on and into place. He whimpers quietly whenever he jostles his wrist too much, and winces at the cold after he snaps the pack and places it down over his wrist. Then he carefully and clumsily wraps the bandages back into place. It's a bit messy and bulky because of the brace under it, but Azuku is pretty sure that once his uniform sleeve is covering it, he'll be able to keep it hidden. Getting his dress shirt and uniform jacket on is a slow and painful process, his wrist throbbing sharply in time with his hammering heartbeat, and Azuku... He's been in pain before. He's had pain worse than this before. But something, some childlike instinct, still has him crouch in a corner of the room by his bag, crying quietly as he rocks himself. He doesn't know if he can do this. If he can work around broken bones until he finds a way to use his quirk without hurting himself anymore. And he has to. All Might has said plenty of times. He doesn't know what's different for Azuku, why Azuku is struggling to control this power when he was able to use it at 100% from the very beginning. Azuku knows, though. It's because All Might is strong and worthy and Azuku isn't. Maybe the quirk knows. Maybe One for All feels cheated, being stolen from the symbol of peace by a weak, quirkless kid. He'll have to earn it then, earn the right to use his quirk, get stronger through the pain until it stops hurting. He's been doing that since he was four years old. He can do it for a little longer. Izuku makes sure the room is set back the way he found it before he leaves. By the time he gets back to the classroom, Aizawa Sensei and the others are back too, filing into the room. Izuku can feel everyone's eyes on him, Aizawa Sensei's especially. He needs to do better. Be better. He has to. Something about Midoriya is still off when he rejoins the class, and it nags Shota all through the night. He hounds his fellow teachers before he leaves that day, asking for every detail they can remember about the classes they taught, trying to piece together what might be wrong. They all say the same things. Midoriya seemed down or off, so in their own ways they try to encourage him, if appropriate, or give him space otherwise. Shota can't ignore the feeling that he's missing something, something important that will make everything else make sense. The feeling is still with him the following day, and seeing Midoriya when he walks into homeroom only makes it worse. The kid looks miserable. Or rather... To the untrained eye, he looks normal, but his smile is strained, his eyes carry pain, and Shota can tell the kid doesn't want to be here. There's an ugly thought forming in Shota's head, one he hopes isn't true. Midoriya's moods seem to shift after they return to school, after the sports festival, and now the kid is definitely hurt and in pain, even if Shota can't figure out where. There are two theories in Shota's mind. Midoriya spends an unusual amount of time with All Might outside of class, and met with the man frequently leading up to the sports festival. Shota doesn't like the idea that the number one hero would belittle and hurt a child for failing to win, but he can't dismiss it as a possibility, even if it seems ridiculous. The other possibility, of course, is that someone at home hurt Midoriya, either because of his performance in the festival, or for some other reason. Shota thinks that's the more likely possibility. As much as he hates the thought, 
He's no stranger to abuse kids, but it's always harder when it's one of his students, especially one he has a mild soft spot for. He sends a discreet message to his co-workers asking them to keep an eye on the kid leading up to lunch. It's much the same as yesterday, though they do mention that the kid seems a bit more lively and determined today. They see it as a positive thing, but to Shota it's dangerous. He remembers that small, quiet voice from yesterday, the way the kid curled in on himself. Midoriya may just be more determined to hide his problems today. Shota enters the classroom just as the bell releases the students for lunch and approaches his desk at the front of the room. He tries for the most casual approach he can. Midoriya, stick around for just a minute, he calls out. He watches through his hair as Midoriya tenses and nods, and though he smiles at the teasing from his classmates, it's even more strained than it was this morning. After everyone has finally filed out, Shota walks to the door and closes it, seeing Midoriya flinch from the corner of his eye. You're not in trouble, Shota says gently, frowning when his words don't seem to help at all. Midoriya nods politely and shifts in his seat. What, uh, what did you want to talk about? He asks, voice raising in pitch towards the end of his question. Shota walks over and stands near Midoriya's desk, leaning against Saro's. I wanted to ask you again if everything is alright, Shota begins carefully. He holds up a hand to halt whatever answer the kid was going to give. Because I think you're in pain. There. Midoriya definitely flinched at that. As minute as it was. Kid, I'm trying to help. Midoriya gnaws on his lip for a second, before he finally answers. I'm just a little sore, he says. The words sound careful, measured. From the sports festival. I wasn't expecting it to still hurt a bit, but I guess it makes sense. I did have surgery this time. And that... That's news to Shota! His eyebrows raise and he steps closer to the kid's desk. Surgery? He repeats, testing the word. Midoriya looks up at him and nods, confusion and wariness in his eyes. On, uh, on my arm and my hand, Midoriya explains, a faint tremor in his voice now. Shota wasn't informed of that, and it bothers him. He looks at the boy's arms and hands, and it's then that he notices the way Midoriya is holding his left wrist. He doesn't think first, he steps closer, reaches out, and takes the boy's wrist in his hand. His grip isn't tight, but it is somewhat firm. And Midoriya... He whimpers and reacts with a full-body flinch, curling in on himself, but he doesn't pull away. He leaves his wrist in Shota's grip. Despite the way his arm trembles, despite the fact that it's definitely Shota's grip that's hurting him, Shota releases him immediately and meets the boy's eyes. Midoriya looks so wrong. Hurt, betrayed, afraid, afraid of him. Midoriya? Shota says softly, slowly crouching so he can better see the boy's face. I'm sorry, kid. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't realize it was... injured. Midoriya's mouth trembles, and he looks like he wants to believe Shota. Will you show me? My hand will stay right here. Shota places his hands on his own knees, keeping them visible. After some time, Midoriya relents and nods. The kid shrugs out of his uniform jacket and awkwardly unstraps the bandage from around his wrist. Shota wants nothing more than to help, but he has to do this on the boy's terms. He can't stop the hissing breath he sucks in through his teeth when he sees the brace that's under the bandages, and the dark bruising around the kid's wrist. Oh kid, Shota whispers brokenly. 
All right, let's get you to recovery, girl. If Shota thought the kid's flinch when he grabbed his wrist was bad, it's nothing compares to the flinch he sees now, or the way Midoriya shakes his head and shrinks back in his seat. Shota settles back down on his heels and tries to puzzle this out. He can't. You don't want to go to recovery, girl. Shota asks, carefully. Midoriya ducks his face down, hair shielding his eyes, but it doesn't stop Shota from seeing the tears that drip down his chin. Can't. Midoriya's voice is hoarse and broken. Shota's hands shake a little against his thighs. Why not? She, she said I... She won't heal injuries like this anymore. Midoriya chokes out between quiet, hitching breaths and near sobs. Shota's blood boils so quickly that it runs cold, and he can't control himself. He can't stop the dangerous tone that enters his voice. She said, what? He hisses. Midoriya flinches, but before Shota can apologise, the kid seems to figure out that Shota isn't angry at him. It's my fault, he whimpers, and Shota hates those words, always hates those words when they come out of the mouth of a child, but never has he hated them this much. I'm the one who keeps breaking my bones, I have to find a better way- Midor- Izuku, please look at me. Shota begs, voice shaking with his anger. Midoriya lifts his head just enough to meet Shota's eyes through the fringe of his hair. There is no excuse withholding medical treatment from anyone, especially a child. It doesn't matter how you got hurt. It is Recovery Girl's job to treat you. We all have to face consequences for our actions, but there is no reason why you should suffer like this for yours. You have done nothing wrong. Will you let me take you to the staff room? Midoriya begins to tremble about halfway through Shota's speech, and jerks his head down in a nod when he's done. Shota stands and stays close when Midoriya follows suit, grabbing the kid's uniform jacket and bag for him. Shota leads him down to the staff room and tucks him into his private office. He gets the kid seated on his couch and after some gentle coaxing, has Midoriya hand over his wrist so Shota can get the brace properly on. He also gives him some ice and an appropriate dose of a good painkiller. I'll be back in just a few minutes, Shota says. Until then, I'll make sure Mike knows not to let anyone in here, okay? Midoriya sniffles quietly and nods. Before Shota leaves, he reaches behind the couch for one of his comfy blankets, handing it to the kid. He closes the door on the sight of Midoriya wrapping himself in the soft fabric and turns around to face Izashi. Don't tell anyone he's in there and keep them out, Shota says. Hizashi, who before Shota spoke looked like he wanted to tease him, now sobers and frowns. I don't think I've seen you this angry in a long time. Hizashi sounds worried. Is everything all right? No, Shota replies through grit teeth, but I'm handling it. Hizashi accepts that and squeezes his shoulder. Okay, he says. Just remember that I'm here if you need me. Shota nods sharply. I know, that's why you're guarding the kid for me, Shota reminds him. Hizashi smiles and bumps his fist against Shota's shoulder, stepping aside to let him leave. Shota enters Recovery Girl's office, and his temper flares when he sees she's not there before he remembers that she's likely at lunch. He's just about to turn around and march through the school to find her when he has a different thought. He steps the rest of the way into her office and lets the door close behind him. Her computer isn't locked, so Shota opens her files and looks through the first-year student folders until he finds Midoriya's. It's empty, 
Shota's stomach twists, and he looks around the office, eyes catching on a filing cabinet with a lock in the far corner. It takes him a few minutes to pick, and he finds a folder of paper files for Midoriya stashed in the back of the drawer. He flips through and begins to read, and he tries to make sense of everything through his ever-growing rage. For starters, not one of Midoriya's injuries since the start of the term seemed to have been reported to his mother. Her signature is missing from every single incident report, replaced instead with recovery girls. Even worse, the consent form for Izuku's surgery seems to have been signed by All Might and Nezu. Shota doesn't understand what the fuck is going on, but whatever it is can't be good. But what really catches Shota's eye are the pages of notes on Midoriya's injuries. Comments about his quirk, theorising why it keeps injuring him the way it does, comparing it to... to All Might, and his use of his quirk when he was Midoriya's age. Once again, Shota feels like something is missing, something that would connect these dots into a full picture instead of the muddy image they are now. But he doubts he'll get those answers if he asks nicely. No, Shota has no intention of asking. He closes the folder and the filing cabinet and takes the folder with him as he leaves Recovery Girl's office. He returns to the staff room to find it, thankfully, still empty, besides Hazashi. He steps into his office and softens when he sees that Midoriya has fallen asleep, curled up on the couch in Shota's blanket. Immediate problem first, he needs to get the kid some proper treatment for his wrist. Then he can deal with the file. He opens the folder and flips to the front page, then takes out his phone and dials the number listed. Hello? Midoriya-san, Shota says politely. My name is Aizawa Shota. I'm your son's homeroom teacher at UA. I need a few minutes of your time. Shota should have known his phone conversation with Midoriya-san would be longer than a few minutes. Despite how much he was buzzing with impatience, he understood why she was crying so much. He can't imagine how difficult it would be to learn that your child was injured and it kept being hidden from you. He gained her permission to take Midoriya to a hospital for some treatment, after which he'll take the boy home, so he can sit down with Midoriya-san and show her everything else. Midoriya seems nervous about going to the hospital until Shota reassures him that he's been treated there before. Predictably, the boy is fascinated by the quirk used to heal the worst of his injury, flower petals that bloom and cover the doctor's hand before she touches his wrist, and the petals glow until the healing is complete. He's left with some minor bruising and aching, with the instructions to take it easy and ice the area until the bruising heals. His excitement quickly drains when he remembers that Shota is bringing him home. More than once during the train ride, Shota has to remind him not to twist his hands together. As they climb the stairs to Midoriya's floor, Shota begins to wonder if he'd misjudged the situation. He stops Midoriya in the hall before they reach his door. Kid, Shota says, is your mom... Does she hurt you? Is that why you're nervous? Midoriya's eyes widen in a way that would be comical in any other situation. No! He yelps, quickly clapping a hand over his mouth to stifle the sound, removing it a moment later and lowering his volume. No, Mum has never hurt me, I promise, Sensei. She, she's the best. I just... it's... There's so much I haven't told her, and I'm scared she might want to pull me out of UA. Honestly, Shota wouldn't blame her if she did, but he doesn't say that out loud. Instead, he nods and squeezes the boy's shoulder reassuringly. I understand, Shota nods. I just had to be sure. Midoriya sounds relieved when he sighs, and he lets Shota into the apartment when they reach the door. 
Midoriya-san predictably fusses over her son, still teary-eyed from earlier, it seems, though she is quick to offer Shota some tea as well. Shota doesn't care much either way, but he accepts, because he imagines the social niceties will help her calm. They sit in the living room together, with cups of tea and some cookies on a tray. Shota opens the folder he took from Recovery Girl's office and hands over some of the files. I need you to tell me if you were ever contacted about any of these injuries, Shota says. Midoriya's eyes widen again, and Shota can't help but split his attention between the boy and his mother. Tears glide over Midoriya-san's cheeks as she reads, shaking her head. She looks at her son, and Shota can see how much she's trying not to look betrayed. Izuku, why didn't you tell me about this? Midoriya looks down at his lap and shrugs, then shakes his head. Shota frowns and hands over another file to his mother. And this? he asks. Midoriya-san presses her hand to her mouth, this time stifling a sob as she reads about the surgery performed on her son less than a week ago. The boy in question squeezes his eyes shut and flinches at the sound of his mother crying. Shota wants the answer now. He wants whatever that missing piece is, because it feels closer than ever, yet simultaneously like it might slip from his hands without warning. Recovery Girl has several pages on your son's quirk, and the injuries it has caused him, Shota says carefully. And the reason I'm here at all is because after this surgery, she apparently told him she would no longer heal injuries caused by his quirk. Midoriya-san breaks. She presses both hands to her mouth and curves down over herself, her body shaking with the force of her cries. Midoriya's eyes snap open, flooded with guilt as he watches his mother cry, frozen next to her. Shota raises from his seat and crosses over to the couch in front of them, looking up at the mother. I don't know what's happening, Shota admits, as much as it pains him, but I want to help. Something here isn't right, and Recovery Girl, All Might, and even Principal Nezu, they're all in on it. Shota glances at Midoriya, sees him still unmoving, every bit of him still screaming his guilt. He knows something, but Shota doesn't know how to ask. She... she was... she is the one who called me. Midoriya-san's breath hitches as she cries. To tell me about Azuku's quirk when it came in at the entrance exam. Shota stiffens and stares between them. When it... what? Shota barely breathes. Midoriya is shaking now, hands fisted in the fabric of his pants. I know, Midoriya-san says. It sounds crazy, but my boy was quirkless until then. We were sure of it. We had the x-ray of his foot and everything, and then... Recovery girl, she called and said Azuku had manifested a quirk. She said it must have been dormant until his body was strong enough to use it. She... Midoriya-san's voice softens, and she sounds like she's far away from them as she speaks. She strongly discouraged me from taking Izuku to a specialist for a second opinion. She told me it would just be a waste of money. I believed her because she's a hero. I believed her, but now all of this I... Shota is still watching Midoriya, watching the way he shakes and flinches, and his eyes dart towards the door like he's thinking of running. Shota reaches out slowly and lays a hand over one of Midoriya's. The boy startles violently, looking down at Shota with wild eyes. Izuku, Shota says softly, rubbing his thumb over the boy's hand, over his scars. Please. Midoriya bows his head, eyes squeezing shut again, as his mother realises what Shota does, that her son has answers. Her hands hover and dance over his form, ghosting across his arm and his cheek, brushing hair back from his eyes. Shota continues to stroke his knuckles, both of them giving gentle comfort, trying to coax the boy into speaking. 
All Might, Midoriya finally whispers, barely breathing the man's name. I got my quirk from All Might. It shouldn't make sense, because it doesn't, except it does. Shota may not know exactly what it means, but the dots all suddenly snap together into a clear and enraging picture. He tells them then of a quirk that stockpiles power passed from one person to the next, of eight users before him, all champions of justice, including the man himself, All Might, how they met, what happened on the roof with the sludge villain, how All Might then offered the boy his quirk and trained him to prepare for it. All the while, Shota and Midoriya-san are careful to stay gentle with him, even as anger burns in their eyes. The boy is exhausted when he finishes, and Shota retreats to let Midoriya-san convince her son to go to his room for a nap. When she returns, she all but collapses onto the couch, and Shota joins her. For a long time, nearly an hour, both of them are silent. They sit side by side, stewing in their rage at All Might for training a child for this power that breaks his body without ever thinking to involve the boy's mother or Shota once he started at UA. At Recovery Girl for keeping All Might secret and for hiding the boy's injuries from his mother so she wouldn't pull him from UA because he needed to stay with All Might. With Nezu for allowing it all for reasons still unknown to them. Shota is the one who finally breaks the silence. I'll help you, he murmurs. If you want to. Sue? Midoriya-san finishes for him, matching his volume. He nods. He means it. She's well within her rights to sue, and Shota can't bring himself to think of a single reason why she shouldn't. I can't, Midoriya-san whispers. I can't. Shota's mouth twists down, and he wants to shake her, to take this timid woman by the shoulders and demand to know why. Instead, he turns his head to look at her, and she does the same to look at him. He doesn't need to ask. Those villains, they're already targeting you, eh? Midoriya-san says. Targeting All Might. Azuku could be a target too. If I... If I do that, if it got out, what they did, it could ruin them. And I don't want to care, but I... It would give those villains what they want. And I'd be taking All Might away from Azuku. And he's the only one who actually understands this quirk. I would be putting so many people in danger. What if the villains went after more kids while the school is breaking? What if they found out about Zuku or... She isn't finished, but Shota understands. He can see the logic. Too many innocents could be hurt and put in danger for the sake of one kid, one family. But fuck. Aren't they enough? Something has to change, Shota says. It can't go on like this. I won't let it. Midoriya-san smiles weakly at him and reaches out to pat his hand. You're a good man, Aizawa-san. Mum and Aizawa-sensei have been in a room meeting with Principal Nezu, All Might, and Recovery Girl for hours. The room is definitely soundproofed. Azuku has tried pressing his ear to the door to try and hear something, anything, his only reward had been silence, so now he sits on a couch in the staff room, trying to get some of his homework done. He doesn't know if he made the right choice, telling Mum and Aizawa-sensei the truth. But he didn't know what else to do. He jumps when the door finally opens, and Aizawa-sensei walks out. No one else joins them, even as Aizawa-sensei drops down on the couch next to him with a heavy sigh. Izuku bites at his lip and fidgets, trying to work up the courage to apologize. Your mom is a lot scarier than I gave her credit for, Aizawa sensei murmurs. Izuku looks at him as the man puts his eye drops in and can't help a small smile. I've heard that before, 
Azuku replies. Aizawa sensei chuckles and nods. Yeah, I bet, he groans as he sits up and stretches, and then he finally looks at Azuku. Recovery girl is going to retire. Azuku goes numb with shock and guilt, tears stinging his eyes. Aizawa sensei brushes away some of them that fall with his thumb. It's not your fault, kid. She she made a lot of mistakes. She says she never actually intended to withhold treatment from you, and I believe her, but she never should have told you she wouldn't. We're lucky it was just a broken wrist you try to hide. Azuku ducks his head down and fights back more tears. It doesn't seem fair, he admits. For her to leave when Principal Nezu all my- Trust me, they're on thin fucking ice. Aizawa-sensei growls, and Azuku stares at him in shock. The man, at least, looks embarrassed about his outburst. Uh, sorry, I- All that I mean is, your mom is still laying into them pretty good. They'll have to meet her terms. Recovery Girl chose to retire on her own. Oh. Azuku whispers. He's still not sure how he feels about that. Nezu is going to hire a full medical team, Aizawa-sensei continues. Which, quite frankly, we should have had years ago. And, uh, I guess there's more All Might needs to tell you about your quirk, so we're gonna deal with that this weekend. From now on, any time you meet or train with All Might, I have to be there too. Azuku flinches and curls inward, already bracing himself for harsh words. I'm sorry, he whispers. Aizawa-sensei sighs softly. You have nothing to be sorry for, kid. Uh, I- I caused you so much trouble, and now you you have to do this, waste your time on me, and- I don't have to do anything, Aizawa-sensei cuts him off. And helping you, teaching you, will never be a waste of time. You are not a burden on us, Azuku. On any of us. We love teaching you, kid. Azuku can't comprehend that. It doesn't make sense. He lifts his head and looks at Aizawa-sensei. And his protests dry up on his tongue. Aizawa-sensei is smiling at him. And the fond look in his eyes can't be mistaken for anything else. I know it might take you some time to believe that again, Aizawa-sensei continues, and that's okay. We'll give you all the time you need, kid. One day, I hope I can earn your trust. Azuku's vision blurs. But even through his tears, he can still see his teacher, the fresh scar under his eye, the gentle smile, the genuine care, the fact that Aizawa-sensei knows, and it hasn't changed anything. With a burst of courage, Izuku throws his arms around the man's neck and holds him tight. Aizawa-sensei's arms lift to circle around him in return, and Izuku speaks nothing but the truth when he says, You already have. Thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate all the support you've given me. I apologise for how long this has taken, but I am back, and despite the fact some changes may be coming in the future, I am so excited about it all. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. All credits go to the original creator of this fan fiction, Yamadadzawa on AO3. I would highly appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you subscribe to the channel and you hit the notification bell to be notified of when I next upload. There is no pressure to do so though. Thank you for visiting my cosy corner of the internet. Keep growing my sunflowers. Mwah!